Okay. That's fine, Anyadi. By the time we go through reading your profiles, I think you'd be at your desk seated. But let me keep quiet now before they go live. Good afternoon from Lagos, Nigeria, and anywhere in the world you're currently listening or watching this. I am Victor Famubo, the project manager for um, the Nigeria Startup Bill. I'd like to especially welcome everyone to the third of our four learning series titled um, Building Africa Through Talent Development. And this is um, supported by Google. Um, the learning series, uh, as we have it, um, started on the 21st of October and it is expected to run till 11th November. Um, for each of these learning series, we've, we've brought um, pan, different panelists and also um, um, our moderator, um, which it, this, this has actually run through for, for each of the um, learning series that we've had. Um, and the, the learning series of affairs um, within the tech and tech ecosystem. Um, importantly, please look out for flyers and key information on this series on the Nigeria Startup Bill's website, www.startupbill.ng. Um, I repeat, www.startupbill.ng. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, um, Johan, yeah, they will see who is um, the regional. Okay, um, don't mind this network. Thank you, Victor, for that warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in the series of the Nigeria Startup Bill Learning Series. Um, my name is Yuandia Deosi, as Victor just mentioned. I am the Regional Director for Sub-Saharan Africa for BBC Global News, um, the commercial arm of the BBC. And as we are telling the stories around the startup bill, the BBC is also committed to telling Africa's stories to our global audience. Um, this, as we said, theme for this session is building Africa through talent development. It'll be centered around the key issues around the talent, tech talent that we need to enable and grow the startup ecosystem in Nigeria primarily and in Africa as a whole. Um, we'll be looking at um, how 
access to talent affects the growth and development of startups, how the bill, the startup bill affects this access to talent, what, how can the startups be best positioned to um, attract and retain the best talent on the continent and develop them accordingly to enable the ecosystem. So let me introduce my very impressive panel. I'm almost like having goose bumps this afternoon, just about to talk about them. But um, yes, yeah, so I will start off ladies first. Sorry, I'm a feminist, um, but I still start with ladies first. So first on the roll call this afternoon is Amal Hassan. She's the founder and CEO of Outsource Global, Nigeria's leading process outsourcing services company. Um, it services countries in Africa, United States, and Japan, and the UK. Her passion is to unlock Nigeria's development potentials through technology-driven innovation. Value addition has led her to build and capitalize and restructure a series of technology-related businesses that are succeeding in developing talents and creating employment for young Nigerians. In 2013, she founded Outsource Global and currently leads a team of a thou over a thousand staff in three locations across Nigeria. It's a gender balanced company focused on inclusion and empowerment um, with over 50% of the senior management staff are female and 65% of the staff are women. Like I said, I'm a feminist, so she's speaking all sorts to me right now. And is relentless in her vision to increase the staff to 6,000 in the next five years. Um, in 2018, Amal was named one of the 16 women business leaders by Fortune US Department of State's Global Mentorship Program. Welcome Amal this afternoon, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good, af good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, next is Amaka Onwokulu. She has over 12 years experience coming across business and development sectors in Nigeria. She presently leads the research and policy work at Bate Foundation in Lagos, where she implements the foundation's research and policy and advocacy initiatives around entrepreneurship in Nigeria targeted at achieving policy and program design, review and implementation. Since 2015, when she joined Faint Foundation, she has led the development of 12 research reports, including the mapping study of Nigeria's entrepreneurship ecosystem and the impact of COVID-19 on Nigeria's MSMEs, MSMEs. Um, she also led the delivery of six annual policy dialogue programs, which bring together key policy stakeholders and ecosystem players across the public, private, and development sectors in Nigeria to deliberate on research findings and development key, develop create key agreements that influence the foundation's policy advocacy focus. Um, and I would like to say, well, oh, I nearly forgot. Um, uh, she also represents Fate Foundation. Um, as a crit on critical stakeholder groups with the Nigeria Economic Summit Group S M M M S M E community <laughs> practice. Sorry, this M S M E. I'm going to just drop the M and just say S. <laughs> it's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and next we have we have Annie Adi Udabon. Um, Annie Adi is an IT professional. Um, open source evangelist, JavaScript developer, and product manager with over 12 years experience working with startups in the human resources space, computer-based testing and media with the online immune publishing, finance with mobile money, education, logistics, and location-based services, right, so sharing industries. He is currently the program manager, developer ecosystem sub-Saharan Africa for Google. He is a talented go-getter, always adding value. And throughout our last, uh, he has brought professional, um, professionalism, creativity, and optimism, optimism to all his projects. We're looking forward to the conversation with Annie Eddy this afternoon. Welcome. Um, and we have Chukuka Chukuma. Chukuka, are you there? There we go. Um, he's an investment banker, entrepreneur, and partner at Racecourse Capital, a private investment and um, advisory firm with a career spanning over 20 years um, with world class uh, financial institutions, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Solomon Smith, Barney, Citibank, Africa Invest West Africa, and Stambic IBTC. He has executed deals in corporate and project finance across multiple sectors. He specializes in structuring and raising large capital, multi-source and multi-currency financing from cradle to grave. 
please take note of this, those looking for money. So Chukuka is committed to raising the economic potential of Africa through investments in human capital. Um, the arts, technology, and infrastructure, where he sits on the board of several companies, such as Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, SEO, Africa, Evaluation and Staffing Africa, Hosted Insights Nigeria, and DBH Solutions. He is committed to empowering more Africans and making significant roads through inroads through SEO Africa, a world-class training and mentorship program that is modeled after SEO USA. Um, so we'd like to say welcome to Chukuka this afternoon. Hi, Chukuka. Thank you so much for having me, Yuande, and thanks for to all of the panelists. All right. And last but not least, we have Ingi Aboyaji. Um, he's the general partner and co-founder of Future Africa, a platform that provides capital, coaching, and community for mission-driven innovators, building an African future where purpose and prosperity is within everyone's reach. I'm, I'm going to underline that. Um, that's very important. And prior to co-founding Future Africa, he was a deputy director general for um, the Obi Ezekwe 2019 presidential campaign. He also helped build Andela and Flutterwave, two of Africa's largest and fastest growing technology companies backed by global investors. Um, e is more popularly known as E. <laughs> Shall we call you that this afternoon or we're gonna stick to being there uh, on the no, on let's, let's definitely do E. It's okay. faster. E, <laughs> all right then, we're going to do it all the time. <laughs> no worries. Um, so he sits in, numerous numbers of boards at corporate and non-profit organizations and advise a number of national and subnational governments across Africa on how to support high growth innovation driven enterprises in their domains. So welcome my illustrious panel this afternoon. But before we get going, let me just uh, get this started. So we know that the Nigerian, this, this is the third in the series and this is the first time you're joining us. Um, the Nigeria Startup Bill is meant to create an enabling environment for high growth technology enabled businesses, i.e. startups. The law will harmonize the different policies and help startups thrive. And of course, that's welcome in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. Um, it aims to create a framework that solves the problems in the startup ecosystem. And like we said, today we're focused on talent. We'll be looking at the multifaceted problem of Africa's tech talent, the scarcity, the retention issues, and the, how that impacts the activities of startups. Um, the tech ecosystem we know is, 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 is developing at breakneck neck speed. And um, you know, startups on the continent are faced with scarcity of software developers and tech talent. Um, the problem is not unique to Nigeria. Throughout Africa, founders um, of young tech startups are struggling to get good tech ta talent. Um, it's ironic that given the surge of software schools on the continent, that we have this um, you know, gap, skill gap. Um, and with tech accelerators like, um, talent tech accelerators like Andela and Jabea and others, Africa developers are in high demand around the world. Um, most of these developers are locally trained, um, but end up working for startups on continents abroad because of better remuneration and, and conditions and opportunities. And so we have the issue of the brain drain that we've seen in other sectors like the medical sector and teaching and, and education and whatnot. So um, I'm just going to set a few questions out there and then we're going to dive right in. So many people say it's not that we don't have early stage talent it's when you get to senior talent that that's the problem that we can't um, startups can afford the senior talent um so it is the issue a critical mass do we have do we lack a critical mass of developers that we need to um support the ecosystem um is it their demand and supply problem um is mobility of labor the issue and and then we'll really get down to brass tacks what is the solution so my first question and I'll go to E on this. Can you give an overview of talent development in Nigeria and Africa as a whole, as especially as it relates to tech? Sure, sure. Um, thank you very much for having me here. And um, I love the context you've given our conversation. Um, and also the fact that you've correctly highlighted it's not unique to Nigeria. 
Um, I would argue also it's not unique to Africa. All over the world, everyone is looking for talent. So this is not something that's new per se. However, I think there are, it's useful to kind of go down a little bit of history um, um, lane. Um, you know, Nigeria has always been, from very early, one of the few um, African countries that embrace computing very, very early. So, you know, we've always had a culture of software development. In fact, if you, um, if you understand a bit of Nigerian history, we've, we're actually um, through um, um, somebody like a Mr. Shenny Williams, responsible for adding images to the, to the M MySQL databases, um, image blobs. Before then, you could only put text and numbers in MySQL databases, but now you can put images because of work done by Nigeria. So we have, we've built incredible amounts of capacity around technology and technological change. Um, and then we went on to the CCNA era with Cisco, everybody taking the certifications. And then we went to the um, NI, NIT era where people started to go to computer schools. So this has, this has always been in our blood, as I say. It's, this is not something that's new. We've built and scaled new um, ta ta talent for technology. In fact, to, to the point of over, oversupply um, um, very, rather quickly. So it's not new per se. But the challenge I think with this dispensation um, is that, you know, as you can imagine, the stacks have changed, um, the, the things have stayed. And the real challenge that we face as a community is, is threefold in my mind. The first is um, there is no managerial talent available to mentor new developers. So even after you have done the work to train, um, the reality is that if you get an entry-level developer, even if, I've, even if I spend all the money in the world training him, there are things that only time can teach. So he needs to be in an environment where he will learn um, on the job. And right now, we don't have many managers who are trained to mentor developers on the job. The second thing is we, we have a very limited supply. So ordinarily, um, our universities, our polytechnics, our colleges of technology and education are supposed to be supplying us with the talents that we need to be able to, to proceed on these things. And um, at the very least, a lot of the things that we teach in boot camps, we should be taught in school so that what is left is for the employer to do what they need to do on the job. And um, I think that we haven't built enough infrastructure and access within the universities. Um, the curriculum issue has now become uh, irrelevant by, of, of and by itself because of the plethora of content on the internet. So no one's going to fight anybody about curriculum anymore, but we're still fighting for infrastructure, you know, buildings that are decent, well lit, um, you know, infrastructure, internet, um, and we're fighting for access. We need devices for young people to be able to access the learning. And so that also is necessary. Um, and then the third thing that we haven't really built um, the competence around yet is, um, is actually being able to measure um, and assign competencies for different elements of, uh, um, of, 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 um, of, of talent. So you have somebody who presents themselves to be one thing, and we don't yet have standardized ways of knowing whether they are that thing or not. Um, some of the systems that have been designed um, have been built on paradigms that favor those who are privileged and can speak good English, not necessarily those who are talented and perhaps might be a bit behind on the English aspect, but have the brilliance and the problem solving skills and the leadership skills and can be taught English as well. Um, so those are the three elements 
of our talent ecosystem that haven't been fully developed. Managerial talent that is able and willing to mentor young people learning on the job, infrastructure and access, um, particularly in our universities where we should actually be building supply. Um, and finally, competency um, standards and skill sets that allow us to know what we see is what we get. So I think those are the areas where we have work to do. Okay. Managerial talent to mentor, the young talent coming up the ladder, infrastructure in our universities and access in the universities, because sometimes the basics are not being taught. So you're coming into a work environment and they're asking you to teach them what they should have learned in college. And third, having the competencies. Annie, Eddie, do you have any more to contribute towards that in terms of um, the, the, the talent pool and, and what is lacking in terms of uh, when we're get, reaching these young developers prior to coming into your office space at Google? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty difficult to talk about talent after Ini has spoken about it. He's been there, done that. Um, I, always, I always said that Ini was someone who solved two big problems for engineers, you know, getting trained and getting paid. And, and those are two very connected issues to even make someone want to pursue a career in technology. Um, so thanks, Ini, for doing a lot uh, on both counts. Um, the, there's a, I mean, the, there's a guy on, on, in Google in, in the, the moonshot company at Google called X, um, called Astro, Astro Teller. And he has a famous saying about how you solve problems. Like, so um, I would just allude to that a little bit just to help solidify what Ini has said, and then to also like appreciate the magnitude of the problem and the approach to the problem. So let's say you have a car, right, that can go from Lagos to Abuja with a full tank of fuel, maybe 60, 60 liters of fuel, right? Um, if you wanted that car to go from Lagos to Kaduna or to Kano with the same 60 liters of fuel, you probably could tweak the car a little bit such that instead of going 600 kilometers with a full tank, it could go 800 or 900 kilometers with a full tank, right? However, if you wanted that car to go from Lagos to Cairo with one liter of fuel, you have to start all over again designing the car. There's no way you can tweak that kind of car to get you from Lagos to Cairo. It's just impossible. So when you think of the magnitude of the problem that we have with talent, and we think of the current infrastructure, the universities, the institutions, the curriculum, the mindset, what we are trying to do to fill the infrastructure gap, to provide the talent that the ecosystem needs, to provide the opportunities that the world needs, we can't adjust the current educational system. It's just not possible to get that kind of surplus at a very high skill level, right? So things like what the Gebeyas, the Andelas, you know, the Decagons, the Semicolons, and a lot of people are doing, even those who are putting money into it, right? How many people are putting money into universities in Nigeria or polytechnics as venture capital? But people are putting billions of dollars into, you know, talent accelerators. So, so the approach to how we are going to solve that problem can't be incremental. It has to be completely exponential because that's the magnitude of the problem. So I, I like what he has, has said and what has an, a, outlined, um, and we completely agree. And I know that he even agrees that we need to do something radically different. I've seen him try to build a city. There's, there's so many things that need to be done, but the amount of work that is being done and has sort of like helped build our ecosystem, accelerate us over the last four to five years, take companies from ideas on someone's laptop to a unicorn or to some massive acquisitions, that is hugely commendable, right? I work with communities across Google, um, uh, and this is students, these are um, city groups, whether it's in Medjugri or Ikodek Pene or Uyo. And then there's, there's this little 100 or 200 people that you can touch. And out of those 200, about 1% of them each eventually get great jobs locally or internationally. But like, this is a country of 200 million people. So even if I'm providing opportunity or resources for 100 or 200 people, it's not just enough. So even at the scale at which I operate and the leverage I have, we still need to do a lot more radically different things. So, so I think we are on the right track. We're heading in the right direction, but the rocket fuel we need and the trajectory we need to take is something that for, for our like this, you know, the, the start of bill, it has to be radically massive for it to have the kind of effect we want. We're on the right track, 
but we need a thousand more Eans, a thousand more Chukukas, a thousand more Amals. We need everybody, and of course, a very conducive government environment, a thousand more local and foreign Googles, you know, to get to the demand and the supply that uh, we, are, we are truly capable of. Scale, scale, scale. So a lot's going on, but we need to scale it up is what I'm taking home from Aniado this afternoon. So moving right along, Amal, how can, so we've said this thing about, um, uh, we're not gonna, a lot of money is going into the tech accelerators, but are, they're not going into our institutions of learning. So how can Africa make more talent more formalized and how can its youth be provided with the necessary support so they have the desire to grow the continent's economy? So I'm thinking, We've said, um, I think it was Annie and Eddie or it was any that said, look, the universities are the universities. We're not worried about the curriculum. We can go on the internet and get the right curriculum. And But how do we get that? Because we can't get to Google and now want to learn the basics. That's that's not how it works. You really get to Google and you need to hit the ground running. They're a business. So, um, and all the other players here. So how can we get that talent and and the, 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 the skills they need more formalized? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I, I always think of the statistics, right, um, about retaining talent and providing skill sets for our talent to be able to promote entrepreneurship and startups, right? And this is what the, 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 the startup bill is addressing. So if you take Nigeria as a case study, we grow a million graduates every year, right? How many companies do we have within Nigeria that can provide employment for this, for, for these graduates? The only way we can actually work it out and get our skill sets and talents within Africa is to create employment. How do we create employment? Is to promote innovation, startups, and entrepreneurship. How do we do that? Which is what the bill is trying to address. So one way to do that is to look at a case study of A's company or outsource our company. So look at outsource, for instance. It took me eight years to start the company. I started it four times and failed, but we went live in operations five years ago. And today we have a thousand employees providing services, not just for Nigerian markets, for mostly US, UK, Japanese markets. 90% of our clients are US clients. We have, um, we have lawyers waking up in Nigeria and serving the US market, which addresses the issue that once you train, once you graduate, yes, uh, uh, a lot of people say Nigerian education does not really address the skill set gap, right? So once they come out, but Nigerians are eager to learn. Right, Africa as a whole is really eager to learn. And once you, you provide the right environment, the right system and infrastructure, they will learn and they will deliver. There is no client in America or US or UK uh, or Japan that has, that has requested for a service or a skill set that we are not able to find that skill set within Nigeria, be it lawyers, be it accountant, be it software developers, and they're all trained practically within the job and they are delivering very, very well. So how do we, like he said, like Annie said just now, how do we replicate A's and Annie's and Amal's and everybody, you know, that is that has started a business and growing it? How do we create an enabling environment for entrepreneurs to thrive? How do we make it that if an Amal from Kano gets up and have an idea to, for outsourcing, can establish that business within two months, three months, right? How do we provide the right education to in innovators and entrepreneurs that would foster growth within the, the, the sector? How do we do that? And this is what the, the startup bill is trying to address to ensure that once somebody has an idea, that idea becomes massively <laughs> uh, um, creates yes. a, a scale, scale in a, in a, in a very uh, you know, massive way. How do we do that? 
you know, with the right kind of environment, with the right kind of boost, just very little boost, which is highlighted in the startup bill, who will get there, who will move Africa forward. I was talking to a client yesterday and uh, he was just talking about, it is a race for Africa, it is a race for Africa. And he kept on repeating it. And, and really it is a race for Africa. How do we take advantage of it? How do we <laughs> take this advantage of it and, 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 and make it uh, achieve its full potentials? So let me not talk too much. I don't know if my time is up. <laughs> yeah, so brilliant. One thing I did took home and what is commendable is what you said, you started the business eight years ago. It failed several times, but you clearly saw the opportunity. And I think that's the, the, the beauty of your story in terms of the environment was doing whatever the environment was doing, whether enabling or not policies, there are not talent, there are not, but you saw the, the, the business. And that's what it is, right? That staying power to commit to a business and, and, and maneuver all the issues. And, and kudos to you for sticking through it. And, 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 and it's about timing. Maybe you were just early at the game, you know, and, and that could have been another issue as well. Um, but thank you for that. But we repeat the same thing. There are businesses that have shown, done the POC, the proof of concept, and it just needs to be replicated across, going back to Inietti's point and also to um, E's point earlier about scaling. But I'm going to move on. You've now built this business, and I'm going to take this to Chukka. Someone like Amal has built her business. He has built his business. In your opinion, Chukka, what are the struggles of now retaining that talent in Africa? I mean, thank you very much. Uh, great question. Um, you know, there's so many ways that um, we're finding that we're really retaining talent. Um, this generation, I certainly believe that they're very interested in um, equity. They believe in the story of growth and learning and, you know, wanting to stay on to build, you know, a dream. Um, in this current environment, I mean, over the last three years to five years, there have been so many young people that have also come to Nigeria. They, you know, So there's people on ground in Nigeria, but there's people that have moved into Nigeria as well. We don't track those numbers. Um, I met just this, um, just this last December, I met five Yale graduates who were moving to Lagos. Now in terms of retention, um, the importance there, I think, you know, because obviously we're, you know, it's a global, competition for talent. Um, Canada is there throwing, you know, things at our people, the US, the UK, everywhere that you think there's a skills program, there's interest in getting the kids out. But on the local level, you know, the opportunity to build a solution that actually delivers something massive is huge. And it's almost like a like a, a string in your heart that a lot of these kids are saying to themselves, if they can buy into the vision of, you know, the founders and they're being taken care of um, in terms of, you know, basic pay and stuff, they will commit to your vision and they would work through, um, through the night to essentially deliver on those things. I mean, if I, if I use myself an example, I was in the States and I moved to Nigeria um, almost 20 years ago. And, you know, what kept me at the places I worked was, you know, how much my work was valued in terms of, you know, you, you, the scale of things that you do in, in Nigeria. You don't have racism. You don't have a lot of other things that people deal with abroad. So you're able to impact the organization in a much meaningful way, you know. Um, and I also think that the problems that we're looking to tackle are very personal. Um, you know, the solutions that are being driven are very personal. These are not... Um, these are not a bunch of, um, you know, just it, it, a lot of these, the kids I speak to, they don't seem to see it just as a job or, or you know, there's, there's, there's a need to, to sell it as a mission. So I think that's the first thing I would say. Um, the, the truth is that the, the main difference between a developed country and a developing country is really quality of human capital that's deployed. And by that, I mean, if you train people, um, develop them properly and give them a task that they're to deliver on, you'd be surprised how much they'll go to bat for you if you're taking care of them, if you're not abusing your staff and things like that and focusing on 
you know, when they come into work and, you know, um, and treating them like kids. So I think, you know, ownership of a large vision is very, very important. And of course, the right remuneration. And to the extent that there's any upside in terms of equity, you will definitely get people staying with you and seeing out that vision. Brilliant. So um, I've taken a couple of points in this, and I think it's so important because I remember when I was starting up in my career, you know, I was paying rubbish when I moved back to Nigeria from, from England. I must have had something wrong with my head if I really think back to it. But um, in terms of you just felt valued, the work that you were doing was important. Um, it, you can make more impact here than you could probably make abroad in, in a big institution. And three, in terms of the, if you commit, and I think that's been the one thing that's got around this conversation this afternoon, train and develop them. They will stay on because they know they're getting that value from you. Obviously pay is, is important, but that I'm getting trained. What I didn't get in college, I'm getting from this organization that's giving me the skills that I can go to else anywhere else in the world and be a superstar is very um, important. Now I'm gonna take this forward to Amaka. Um, how can, uh, Fate Foundation has been doing wonderful work for many, many years, but let's look back in terms of, you know, um, Amal mentioned in terms of a million graduates, but forget the graduates, what about the informal sector? So how can the informal sector be expanded for more job opportunities? And I'm putting this to Amaka. Okay, thank you. Um, I really apologize. My network has been really shaky today. Oh. Um, I'm not sure why, <laughs> but please let me know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Bad thing. Okay, you. excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Yuande, for that question. I think that the simple answer, my simple answer would be to provide structure and to provide support. But by providing structure, what do I mean? First off, we need to look at data, which is a critical component. And I may, maybe this is my research background also speaking. Um, now to say, um, how are we able to digitally identify everyone within the informal sector? It's very easy for us to have conversations, oh, the informal sector, the informal sector, but what exactly is the informal sector? Who are these people within the informal sector, right? Um, so I think that tech, needs, tech can come in here um, by helping us identify, you know, sort of creating a digital, footprint in a way. Who are these people within the informal sector? Where do they operate? What are the sectors that they focus on, you know, and all of that. And then based on that, it's, it's easier for us to begin to design programs or design policies that we want to implement to provide support. A lot of times when I um, engage in conversations around the informal sector, I'm always quick to point out that, you know what, um, maybe what we should be doing is not looking to formalize the informal sector, but actually meet them where they are, right? Understand the system. So delve into that space. How does the system operate? For the informal sector to get to the point that it is today where we're having conversations around the informal sector, they're already a strong force in a way, right? So some things are working, obviously, and apparently. So the, the owner shouldn't be to jump into the space to try to formalize the sector because we think that's the way to, to expand the capacity from that sector. So it's really saying, how do we get into that space? How do we understand what the systems and structures that they have, how, how it has worked and how it has provided um, results up until, up until now? And then identify the groups that they work with, right? And then walk through those groups to get their attention. What do I mean? So a lot of them work in associations, for example. A lot of them work with BMOs, for example, right? So if we're, we're looking to provide support, it's very critical that we're working with these existing channels and existing um, vehicles in a way to be able to bring that support. Whether, whether we're thinking about providing funding or even capacity building, you know, for example, we're talking about tech. It'd be nice to have, you know, uh, our businesses within the informal sector using tech. Uh, you know, and, and it's not impossible, but right for us to be able to reach them, the, the associations that they are used to, that they trust, how do we work with those associations to be able to bring the support that is needed for the sector to be able to expand and provide opportunities, right? With regards to identifying people, I, I like the example, I like what Smidan did, you know, where Smidan was able to provide a channel for people to register with them. So people may not be able to, so, so informal businesses within the informal sector uh, may not have all of the requirements to register with CAC, that's very formal, for example, but they can register with Smidan. So um, I, I think that um, um, platforms like that 
um, collaborations like that, opportunities like that would help to bring structure to the informal sector without necessarily disrupting the way things are done. In a way, just improving on what, what, what exists um, and that will lead to expansion um, um, and provide uh, expansion and then um, lead to increase in job opportunities for, for young people. So that's the way I would look at that. Great. So I hope I, you I, heard I, me. We heard you perfectly. I don't know what you're talking about your network. It's perfectly <laughs> But um, what I did take home from what you just said was this whole, because sometimes we think what the informal sector are doing needs to be changed into what the formal sector is doing. And then it doesn't get accepted because at least to what I'm doing, it's working well. Why must it change? I remember um, many years ago trying to see the the Isusu and savings groups, people trying to change them to come to the bank and do all sorts. I'm like, no, 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 no replicate you bank go to them collect said money put in bank account exactly exactly same thing tie whose month is it to get the money deposit transfer to them at the end of the month it looks just like the traditional exactly what you're saying and i think this is what in terms of expanding those skills building their businesses if we say access to tech will make your business grow take the tech Uh to them and how to use it exactly what i'm taking exactly. home would be the key to do that so excellent don't try and change them into our formal rigid structures innovate to meet them right. at their point of need brilliant I, I love that and so i'm taking that home um i'm going to take we're here because of the niger startup bill so any back to you you there yeah um how does the niger startup bill just to bring out a few points address this issue of uh, talent migration across Africa, if it does. Oops, you're muted. Um, are you there? You're, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry, can you repeat? I, I, I missed the... Uh... Sorry, I was saying that we're here because of the Nigeria startup bill. So how yeah. does startup bill address the issue of tra- talent migration across Africa? Fantastic. I, I mean, I'll be honest and tell you my, my understanding of the startup bill is that it's not intended to address that challenge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I don't believe that that's necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that what it will do for us as a country is that it would open us up to the opportunities that come with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So for many of our young people, rather than work or have to migrate to work in other African countries, it will be possible for them to apply their trades um, from Lagos or from Kwara or from Ibom or from Calabar, right? Um, without having to leave Nigeria and we would have the right kind of um, software and incentives and we'll be able to better leverage the talent base and so on and so forth. Brilliant. So keeping them here instead of leaving, take the advantages of the Pan-African Free Trade Agreement and still grow their businesses, innovate, build their businesses and and, and so so on and so forth. So I'm going to ask one contentious little question, right? So we've talked about, we still have this problem, right? We said the, um, that was mentioned at the start of the conversation with Inny, where he said the senior talent that would mentor the up and coming talent is not there to do the mentorship and the grooming and the growth. Um, And some might say the solution, the issue there is that we can't afford the senior talent in in, in our market um, and therefore they won't be here. Um, So some have said VC money, 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 money. If we have more money, that will solve everything. Bring this VC money, we can afford to pay the the talent and, and, and problem solved. That's one argument. Another argument is that it's on the, the onus is on the startup to start doing the upskilling. So who wants to take that? I would throw that out in terms of, is it both? Is it, oh, I like that. Annie, Eddie, please jump in. More money, more money, or you need to groom your people to become the senior talent. What would you say is the solution? I'd go for the more money, more money solution. I mean, Cause I, I mean, the senior talent bucket. So I'd like to get more money. I'm sure you can pay me more money. Um, but, but this is, I, I think we, we need to look at this very, uh, from a very different point of view, right? Which is, and I know people have talked about this, you know, like, I know this is being recorded, but like, go put guys from KPMG and Deloitte and all that. But you see, um, a lot of the companies 
I mean, Google is 20 years old, right? So if you have someone in, on, in Google who's been 40 years on the job, right? He, he hasn't spent those 40 years at Google, right? If you have someone who's a senior manager at you know, Uber or Paystack or, or Florida Wave or Cowrie Wise or Team App, it's very likely that person is not getting senior talent just by being in the startup ecosystem, right? And, and, and when you think of domain expertise, we talk of FinTech, right? There's no FinTech without Fin. It, it, in fact, there's so much more Fin than tech in FinTech if you really get to the bottom of it. So when it comes to senior talent, I think the first thing is where are you looking for senior talent, right? Um, if it's senior technology talent, that could be tough. But like Ian said, if you really dig deep into the stories of Nigerian technology companies, you know, when you start going all the way back to the, you know, Shani Williams, the Aladi Comos, the, you know, Leo Stane case, there actually is senior talent that you probably need to bring onto your board. You probably need to look into some of these companies that are 30 years in Nigeria. Look at NIBS. Our, our banking system is more advanced than many banking systems all over the world. Like those, those products were built in Nigeria by Nigerians who started off on some small laptop or some Pentium computer and started writing two, three lines of code that are right now running billions of transactions. They are the rails for even the most successful fintech startups, right? And then eventually they are, the, you know, so, so, so you need to look in those places. The, the other aspect about senior talent, and I think um, startups can, or like, yes, yeah, startups, since we're talking about startup bill, can really offer them is, is, is culture and quality of life, right? Um, a lot of the senior talent in Nigeria is locked in one local government. It's your sa, right? Everybody living in Ikorodu, you want to be in Oshogbo, head office is in Victoria Island. And that includes four hours of traffic or very expensive rent living within the vicinity of Victoria Island, right? Um, I want to move back to you. Like, I want to move back to Calabar. You know, you, talk, you mentioned this. Those cities, I mean, the rent I'm paying in Lagos would get me a mansion with maybe a lake and a golf course and a fish pond if I was in Ikonobasi or if I was somewhere in Akampa, right? So with tech, what, what you're able to offer with things like remote work, with like uh, other kinds of incentives, is you can actually lure away people. I, I would take a 50% pay cut to leave Lagos and still have this, almost the same quality of life, right? Because I think with half the money I'm earning, I could get a better quality of life if I was living in Calabar, right? You know, fresh fang and all that kind of stuff. And everyone knows I like food. So I, I recently I went to Yo and I found people who had deliberately, these are not even indigents of Akwaibom State, but had deliberately moved back to or moved to Uyo. They probably went there to do a project and then they realized it's a small city, great food. There is an airport, there is infrastructure, you know, th they could live there. Like internet is still a challenge, but they could, they could sort of live with it. And definitely, if, if, if more towns, and, and I, I really like what the Nigerian Startup Bill has done in terms of having these regional town halls where they go to Kano and then they go to Kaduna and then they engage the people there, they get government to see the opportunity, they get people, stakeholders, institutions to see the opportunity that with startups, with technology, you can actually be anywhere, and that anywhere really means anywhere, so far as there is infrastructure, and the ability to connect so that I can upload my code, I can join a video call, then I, it's possible for me to do that in Ikonobas. So I think the bill, by really driving awareness, some stuff that was only known in Yaba, Lekki, and Victoria Island, is now known in Enugu, it's now known in Oweri, it's now known in you know, Kara Namoda, it's now known in Medjugorje, right? Um, People have been doing this, like Joss has been ahead, Kaduna has been ahead right from time, Jigawa has been ahead, even like, you know, that was even government policy with Galaxy and the rest. But still, there's just not enough volume. And with this bill, amplifying the volume and bringing these voices, I, I think we can do much more to allow people to know that you can work from anywhere and definitely to lure silly talent to this startup culture and to this sort of remote life, remote way of work that gives you a little more time to yourself and um, gets you out of Lagos traffic, which is currently insane. Get you out of Lagos traffic. So that's, that's you've sold me there. So taking this, I think the startup, I, look, let's just put a hands up to the, the team behind the startup build. This roadshow is taking the information everywhere across Nigeria. So it's not, you know, normally everything's Lagos, Abuja, we'll talk about, and we leave it there. Once we've done those three locations, that's the end of a roadshow and you tick, you know, the box is ticked, but they're really these grassroots town halls where tech is, there are problems that are yet to be solved at all, 
all across the country. And that is what startups do, right? Solve the problems. And, and if they don't know what is possible and they that especially thank God for COVID, right? Because of this remote thing, I can't even imagine. See my you're in my house, but you know, I can't imagine having to go to my office every day. It's actually a, a, would offend me having to go back because I can just do what I need to do and I'm, I'm productive because what you just mentioned, infrastructure is there. I can have access, I can communicate with anybody anywhere across the world to get my work done and deliver. So that balance of money and quality of life and just access to still build is, is so important in this as in this current um, space that we're in. So this is great in terms of just seeing the opportunities besides money. Like you just said, well, I'm not sure you take that 50% pay cut, but I'm gonna just hold you to that. But it is possible that if you wanted to balance of quality of life, and move back to home to you. It is possible now, and it will be enabled by this bill. I don't know, um, Victor, do we have any questions? I haven't seen any come up apart from people wanting more in information on inter possible internships and that sort of thing, which we will probably um, uh, email out at the end of this in terms of, um, the oh, Chuka, please go ahead. I didn't see your hand there. Yeah, no, just uh, while we're looking at the questions coming through, just a random uh, thought. So the Ministry of Education, right? Um, you know, I love the point that Anid mentioned regarding rocket fuel. Um, the Ministry of, of Education is very, very critical in help. In we need to get into that budget, okay? Through this startup bill, we need to get into that budget because the Ministry of Information uh, of Education is where my mom spent a lot of time. I come from. I'm a son of a teacher. And they have this inspector division that part of their task is going around schools to vet them and things like that. Well, if we can make sure that they're doing their job in terms of deployment of the budget, even the one that is being deployed now is insufficient, but forget about that. The one that you're deploying, making sure that each dollar is accountable and then carving out a piece for STEM, starting out at primary school and working your way up because you know, you can't, you know, yes, you're doing STEM and you're a good programmer, but you're already 21 and you didn't learn English along the way, or you're not, so, and you're going to need to communicate your thoughts very clearly, right? So we need to actually start right at the beginning at, with a five-year-old, with a three-year-old and work your way all the way up. So that's the one thing I wanted to say. Um, and then the other thing was, you know, this whole um you know, if you think of what Elon Musk is doing now in Texas. So Texas is getting a lot of people from California, right? And and startups is what's driving Texas today because they've started moving in, they're moving to Austin and stuff. The very, very first engagements that started two to three years ago, they're not, they're not just moving now. Two to three years ago, they went to the University of Texas, University of Houston, Austin. They went down another level into... So like, for instance, the magnet schools that are in my neighborhood here, they went one level down and they started investing, they, you know, Elon Musk and I do in a university, but they started investing physical dollars into public school budgets. Two of the schools that my kids go to right now are both, have both gotten funding to expand the schools. And that expansion is a STEM driven expansion where they'll have more facilities and stuff. So we need corporations, we need new taxes for people, especially people that have not been paying tax. I don't want to mention any names, but there's an allergy out there that we hear doesn't ever pay tax. If we can get some specialized taxes um, out of the biggest hands in Nigeria and on the continent in Africa, we can put that into a specialized fund that supplements the education budget, but it becomes like a PPP, which means we have to sit on you know, the, the, the administration of those budgets because we don't want the money to miss and turn into expensive bras. So I did want to mention that. <laughs> you had to go there. Never mind. I, I, Moving I, I, and staying on point. But I've got a question that's come through. I'm not, I'm not going to say my opinion on this question, but the question is financial support from the government to startups is not working best and um, best. Um, so how would talent survive? So I guess this is access to finance from government. Who would like to, Amal, Mark, I haven't heard you guys' voices for, for a minute. Um, uh, what do we think about government and support to drive this 
uh, the funds that uh, startups need to be able to attract and retain talent. Yeah, so let me let me speak to that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not because of the number of startups that are forming informally, whatever the work the, the government is doing is really not consolidated because there are different ministries, there are different parastatals doing different things in isolation. So the only way to solve that and have it, you know, felt by, by, by all the startups is to consolidate this, this effort because CBN is doing their effort, BUI is doing theirs, uh, uh, Nexim is doing theirs. How do we bring it all together to actually push it to the right startups, to the right startups that will make great impact into the economy of this country, which is exactly what the startup bill is trying to address. If there is an agency that takes care of, of consolidation, of regulatory framework, of incentives, of uh, pioneer status and all that and all that put into one agency, then that agency will also work with different parastatals to be able to come up with the list that are uh, the list of startups that uh, that are really uh, uh, that are really good for the economy. Then you know it's going to be felt. You know, so it's a lot of work, but it has to be done that way. But I'm telling you, the way that question is being asked, yes, a lot of entrepreneurs are not. <laughs> are not able to access this funding. Uh, why? Because it's not consolidated. There has to be a well-structured way of actually delivering uh, this process. Oh, yeah. So con like this, how this bill is consolidating a lot of policies, the work yeah. going on in terms of giving out funding also needs to be consolidated so that the different layers can access this funding. So I'm, that's what I'm taking home from that message. Thank you so much, Amal. So I've got another question that's come through. And I'm trying to structure this. Um, well, can we have more of our founders and top talent spending time in our institutions of various levels and sizes, passing on knowledge in a coordinated fashion? How can we coordinate this? And do we see value in this activity? Um, Who would like to take that? Um, okay, Annie, Eddie, go ahead. I'll take that very quickly. So. One of the things I was really impressed about, I think, four or five years ago, and I think it's still up, um, it still exists till now with Startup School and Y Combinator, is that when you go to Stanford, they get the big names, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the everybody, they come to school and they lecture, right? And I, Ian and I, we had this conversation, we said, we need to bring Sim Shagaya, we need to bring Victor Samota, we need to bring everybody into the school environment, right? Because th there's so much you can do with the ecosystem conferences. 100 people. I mean, the max we get is 2,000 people at what we call Dev Fest Lagos. Um, but, but this, like I'm all said, there's a million people who need to hear this information, right? It's out there. It's on the internet. You can search and find it, but it's not everyone that has, you know, the authority or the, you know, the, what well, this, the competence to go look for this information. So we need to bring the information inside. I totally agree, and I hope the startup bill can also look at that as one of the ways to solve uh, this problem. I want to just tag on to another thing that I think Amal said just before this. And I think she's also been a bit modest uh, because when it comes to solving this problem, one of the problems I see apart from like dual regulation is we're reinventing the wheel. I have no idea how to raise capital. I have no idea how to run a 1000 person organization, right? And I work for, you know, big company, big platform. There are some skills that some people have that you should not even try to attempt to reproduce. So when it comes to how do we get a company to employ a thousand people or employ 10,000 people, please just ask Amal, give her money and walk away. Don't try to create another federal government outsourcing. It, it won't work. You need to fail five times in eight years to figure out how to employ a thousand people sustainably and pay their salaries every month, right? So when it comes to how do we set up hubs in all the 200 schools across Nigeria, you can't do that. Like, just go to Ventures, go to CC Hub, go to somebody, give them a billion naira and walk away. Don't try to, it, it is not the container, it's the content. You can build the number of ICT blocks or AI centers around the country and no machine learning will happen until you have faculty, content, connections, relationships that can make those things happen. 
So right now people have those relationships and they're doing it at maybe a $1 million scale. Government is a billion, hundreds of billion dollar entity. You need to move that money, just like Chukuka said, move that money from the ministry, get the people who are doing some specific work to do that work. And the other work that can be done by people who have the network relationships and experience, please hand over the money to them, set them targets and deadlines and just enforce it. So that's my view on what you need to do with the successful entrepreneurs or the successful, I mean, Amaka and Faith Foundation. Imagine what you would do if you just closed your eyes, give them a billion dollars, walked away and said, come back in six months and tell us what you've done. That's what I would do if I was, if I, if I had the position of, of authority and power, I'll just give the money and walk away. Give the money and walk away. There are a lot of um, companies and uh, doing amazing things that we don't need to, like you said, reinvent the wheel and they just need to be scaled up. Scale up a Miles company, scale up Faith Foundation. And Google's already scaled, so we're just going to leave y'all over there. But, you know, uh, but that's what needs to be done in our market. We're seeing about the local. So how did the local entities scale up? Because Amal needs more people with talent to come and work with her. But like you said, we said the whole thing, is it upscaling within or is it pumping more money into the existing one? It's a balance of the two. So if Amal has more money, that 1,000 goes to 2,000 goes to 10, she knows how to scale it up. It's money that helps her scale and her replicate what she's doing. So thank you for that. Let me get one more question. We're running swiftly out of time. Where did the time go? Fantastic conversation this afternoon. And then we'll just, I'll do a, one closing question. So let me see which one is um, speaking to me. What is the provision for decentralization of, oh, this is very, okay. What is the provision for decentralization of top tech jobs for the local markets while many are gaining the necessary skill sets? Deployment is another issue. Who would like to speak to that? In, yeah? Or did it, should I repeat that question? Yeah, it's saying, what is the provision for decentralization of top tech jobs for the local market? While many are gaining the necessary skill set, deployment is another issue. So anybody want to speak to that? Anybody's running away from this question? Well, it's, it's not very clear. I think mm -hmm. the way, what the person means by deployment is actually getting employment, right? Maybe. Uh, so, I understood so, the first half of the question. The second half is, I was hoping you guys got. Yeah, I, I'm very sure um, that the, once a software developer is actually a very good one, I don't think that uh, using the word of the, 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 the person who deploying uh, the resources would, would not be difficult at all. I can give you an example. Uh, we are currently looking for about 200 medium skill developers within Nigeria, and we are combing every, every corners of this country to actually get them to be deployed and work for an American client. So, so, so it's really, once the skill set is there, I think there should be a database where they can be reachable. I think the problem is actually the issue of lack of database to, to give access to. So we have to go through LinkedIn, we have to do adverts. It's not everybody that goes online at the same, the same time that advert is, is running. But I think we, within Nigeria and outside Nigeria, that, that uh, person with that skill set can be employed without even leaving this country. And that's why we've been trying to promote outsourcing because you can actually stay within the country and provide uh, uh, services to everybody around the world. And, uh, uh, and developers are, are such that they really don't even need an office, <laughs> a company like mine to actually access those jobs. So they can always do that online. So I don't know if I'm able to answer the question, but this is I my think you, I think you tackled it very well. Any, um, E looked like you wanted to contribute towards that question yeah. um, Adam, for a second. Seems to have gone off. Are you there, E? Okay, maybe he's uh, stepped away. But I'm just gonna move on really swiftly because we've so run out of time. So I'm gonna put this last question to everybody on the panel. And I'm so um, thankful for you guys being here this afternoon, but this is our last chance saloon. Where is the biggest area 
for talent opportunity that the continent, we can tailor this down to Nigeria, but if you wanna to speak to the continent, should focus on. Where's the biggest area for talent opportunity that the continent should focus on? One point each, so we don't cannibalize the conversation. So um, I'm going to start with, okay, Ian, you stepped up for a minute. Do you wanna to speak to that question? Sorry, I was, I was actually struggling a bit with my internet and I wanted oh, to okay. know what the question was. Okay, let me think. What is the area for talent? What is the biggest area for talent opportunity that the continent should focus on or we can focus on Nigeria, whichever one you wanna pick on? Where is the talent opportunity that we should be focusing on? Okay, the, 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 the biggest area in my opinion is in, is in um, I would say, um, I'll, I'll break them into kind of three parts. The first is upskilling existing talent on managing people for outcomes. Um, as the industry grows, the most important thing is actually not teaching people new skills, but teaching existing people with the skills how to manage towards an outcome. I find that a lot of the soft skills are missing in quite a number of the people that are already even trained, such that they cannot even be effective because they cannot, they know the skills, but they don't know how to, to problem solve. They just know how to code. I think the second area, sorry, yes. Okay. Sorry, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay. The second area of concern, in my opinion, is, is, that, um, is, that, is that it is, it is really critical for us um, to start to teach um, product, product and, and design. I feel like we have a lot of engineers, but product design has suffered quite a bit. Um, and that's what the consumer actually gets to see or the customer gets to see. So teaching people to be able to prototype, teaching people to be able to do that is, is extremely important. Um, and particularly with the rise of no-code platforms, I would say you can get very, very far um, with, um, with just understanding how to prototype tools using existing um, um, platforms or products. So I think that's something that we should be probably be teaching more of. Um, and then I think um, the, the last one is research and writing. So I feel like for those who are not in, um, in, in, um, in a technical line, you know, just teaching people how to aggregate information from, from different data sources, summarize it, extremely important. Great, so upscaling existing people for outcomes, teach more product and design, and using the research, which I'm gonna to move to Amaka now, You're using the research to inform decision-making. So Amaka, what do you think is the biggest area for talent opportunity that the content or Nigeria should be focusing on? What's the biggest opportunity in the talent space that we should be focusing on in this startup world that we're living in? Oops, is Maka's network okay? Oh, she's frozen. Um, okay, we'll come back to Amaka. All right, then Chukuka. Thoughts can you hear this? me? Oh, okay, we can hear you now. Amaka? Are you there? Okay. Okay, Chukuka, just jump in there while Amaka's uh, network sorts itself out. So, I mean, for me, I, I don't want us to become a Kenya in the sense that um, local ownership is very, very critical to me. Um, you know, we missed it in, in, in the sort of early telecom era and it took us a while to finally get a piece of MTN and a piece of this because we, Kind of missed it in the beginning. The local content bill, the elements of it in this um, in this uh, you know startup bill, which I like, but we need to make sure that it is our faces on the money, um, that we are the ones that ultimately are protected and getting rich. It, it's no fun if all that happens is you leave Yaba to go to Y Combinator, they give you all the money you need and then they ride to the storm and you've got a 5% or 10% hold on the whole thing. So we have to protect the equity in these unicorns that we're making fiercely. To me, that's a big thing. I want local Nigerians to own that, all local Africans. 
Brilliant. So protecting that equity or keep that business here owned by us with us, fund us as much as you, but the ownership, majority ownership should be with us. Great. And that will help with the talent situation that we have. Okay, Amal, what are your thoughts? Biggest opportunity for talent? Uh, thank you very much. I think the biggest opportunity is actually entrepreneurship, right? An average Nigerian is an entrepreneur. We all grew up watching our mothers and fathers sell, uh, you know. So how do we capitalize on that? How do we provide the right skill sets for that, right? If we groom entrepreneurs to actually deliver in accordance with professional standards, then this country will be somewhere else, right? So I think that is a very big area that we need to focus on. It's not just enough for you to be a tech person. How do you, it's not enough for you to be an innovator. How do you carry that innovation into money making business? How, how can it be done to focus more, not just on Nigeria, on the international? How do we become a Silicon Valley? <laughs> do you understand? So I think that's an opportunity, that's an area where it, uh, there, there should be a very big focus on, you know. So, so for, for, for tech- for, Entrepreneurial for, skill set. Yes, exactly. Knowing how to code is one thing, but knowing how to problem solve, build a business, scale a business, all those aspects of entrepreneurship have to be part of that building your tech um, skill set. So that is a very important point because we said startups, entrepreneurs are the future. They're growing the economy. You can't wait to go and work in Shell in those, like in those days. You need to go and make the, the business yourself and, and, and grow the economy. So if you don't know how to grow a business. And now I have my Amaka back. Amaka, your point on this. I'm so happy to have you back. Don't mind this. Network. I'm sorry. <laughs> my internet is really bad today. Don't mind I apologize. The <laughs> okay, so, so my response is going to closely mirror what Amal has said, uh, which is entrepreneurship, right? But on the back of that, I want to touch on education, right? The educational system. And I know that we've sort of touched on it a bit, but I, I really think that there are opportunities there that can be harnessed. Um, right from the cradle in a way, right? So how do we um, um, include entrepreneurial thinking and technology thinking in our educational system, regardless of what sector or what, um, what path it is you are, you are studying to become, right? For example, you read microbiology or you read linguistics and all of that. If you are being taught with an entrepreneurial mindset, right, you can begin to explore opportunities, not just looking for how to get a job when you get out of school, but from school, you're already thinking, what can I do? Because there's an, uh, there's an entrepreneurial approach that's been adapted, right? So it's not just teaching. I'm not even com campaigning or conversing for introducing entrepreneurship as a subject. No, entrepreneurship as an approach as a thinking, how, how do you, and across board, so whether you're studying business management or biology or even Yoruba language, that's what you're reading in school. How do you apply that, that entrepreneurial mindset and technology? So for example, you read linguistics, you could come out and decide that you want to develop an app and you're learning that right from school. It's not when you get out of school, then there's no job, then you're scratching your head and then they tell you, oh, there's a tech, you know, and then you're like, oh, okay, maybe I should leverage tech. No, we're introducing it right from, from, from you know, through the system. And thankfully, uh, there's a lot of work we're doing at the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, right? Um, between the Digital Policy Commission, uh, Digital Economy Policy Commission, and the MSME Committee of Practice around this. And thankfully, we've made a lot of progress um, defining or redefining the curriculum to include digital literacy, new technology and adapt adaptation, right? So I hear um, Inyi and I hear Aniedi, you know, when, when they talked about the fact that right now to scale up in, um, education, we need something that's forceful. But I think that while that approach is going on, we should still also look at the educational system. So it's almost like, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of hitting it from both ends, you know? So while we're doing, using this forceful approach, we're also looking at the educational system because trust me, the question is who, who are the people teaching or preparing the talent for the future? That question is a big question, a big gap around that. And we need to be looking at that critically, I dare say. Thank you.
Thank you. So the edu like we said, the educational system is there. People have been getting, a, thank God for Google, but um, you, you can go and try and educate yourself, but we should have our formal educational system addressing those issues, building their tech skills from, from, the, um, from the cradle, like um, someone mentioned earlier, building that entrepreneurial mm -hmm. understanding. I mean, I just remember having a lemonade stand when I was a kid and you know, girls guide, you know, when you have to sell the cookies. I mean, I, I did primary school in America. I had, you know, going around, that stuff is still stuck in my head in terms of the cuter you look, the easier is what gonna that cookie's gonna sell. You know what I mean? In terms of, oh, can you buy a cookie? So we need to look, teach that um, very early on and make children not de so dependent on their parents or just um, waiting for things to happen to them or waiting for that job to come. While the job might come in future, you should be doing something and you have to have that skill and knowledge through the educational system that um, courses that you take that will help you in your and in setting up for the future. And last but not least, not the least, and Andy, your one point on the biggest area, the talent opportunity area that we should be focusing on. One point, we've run out of time. Yeah, I, I still think it's uh, tertiary education um, and the two reasons why. Uh, that's that's sort of like the culmination of the frustration, right? So when you go to university or like, you know, when you become a graduate, as the way they say it, and then you don't get a job, like that drop off and, and what happens afterwards can be very, you know, catastrophic, right? So I think getting people to have the right mindset when they, even if they don't get it right at the foundation, obviously you need to get it right from the foundation, the STEM and all that. But if they don't, if, if they get to university and within that or polytechnic or whatever college of education, and then within that two to three year or five year period, you can actually, you know, transform the way they look at work, employment, employability, and how they're going to get into the, the, the job market, you know, a lot of people land there and think that they need to be a lawyer, engineer, or a doctor, and every other thing is a failure. And sometimes that's even from conditioned from home. You know, if, if your parents didn't know much better, uh, uh, you know, or if that's all they knew, then that's all they served you, right? So, but now today we have content creators, we have Uber drivers, we have influencers, we have, th there's so many professions that people need to understand are very lucrative. And that there are many more professions that are coming in the next three, four, five, 10, 20 years that even haven't been thought of yet. So that flexibility in mindset you know, is very important. Also in tertiary education, you need that sort of, I think what they call the triple helix. So industry, academia, government. So if government is coming in right now, then we need our industry companies, you know, the flutter waves, the inter switches, the shells, the slum, everyone needs to come in to partner and, you know, do research and uh, um, with, so the industry needs to come and meet the academia and the academia needs to go. We need to be people endowing chairs. We see very um, successful models like this, maybe at the Lagos Business School or Pan-African University. It may be around their connections, but the kind of things they're able to put together and get you know, infrastructure and programs and funding, uh, we need to see that happen across every single tertiary institution. And then I think finally, the intervention that can happen in tertiary education is with the teachers. A lot of the programs we do now for the students, you know, we go student clubs, student training, coding boot camps, right? We need to be able to address, like Amal said, who are the people that are being given the responsibility to raise the next generation of thinkers, of employees. So we need to have programs that clearly address upskilling our lecturers. It's, it's from the mindset, it's from even their technical capacity. Um, I, I give one example. When you do coding right now or programming, you know, some people will say, oh, they're still teaching Fortran and COBOL. Maybe that's all the lecturer knows, right? Um, but university is research and learning. You don't need to teach. Literally, I could go to a class and say, what problem we want to solve is we want to build a weather app or a flood forecasting app. Use any language you know. You can use Java, you can use Python. I, all I need to know is those names, Java, Python, back end, front end. And I can stay from a very 40 foot view and say 40,000 foot view and say, go use one of the current languages, solve the problem and come and show me. And then if you can come and show me on an app or on a phone, or on a laptop, how this thing works, the internals are not necessary. I don't have to instruct you the syntax on everything. I just need to be able to guide you. So if, if some of our faculty started realizing that they don't necessarily need to teach like it was alphabets, they just need to guide and mentor and probably even start taking equity in this company. So people come and do a project with you, you supervise, you guide, you connect them to industry pairs, me, you, Chukka, you facilitate those conversations and even take a 1% equity. If, if those guys in Babcock are taking a 1% equity in Paystack, 
they would probably be on this call. <laughs> right. So, so that mindset of what is your role as faculty, not teacher. I think that intervention in tertiary education, we need to explore it and we need to do a lot more in that area and support everyone within that tertiary ecosystem. You know, we like ecosystem in tech. So, so we need to support everyone there, the students, <laughs> faculty, the administration, the industry, the funding, the government, um, all the stakeholders should, should, should be helped, should be supported. Fantastic. So just to recap, this issue, I mean, we started off the conversation, he said that this issue of the skill gap is not an African one, it's not a Nigerian problem, it's a global problem. And what's happening is that we are sometimes not looking at the entire scope of what needs to be done to make sure that the talent is retained, whether it be if you're in a company, the educational system is the educational system, but people are still learning, whether they're learning from on online resources or they get a job and someone is training them, but that's where it's sustainable. You will retain talent if you're building their capacity, making them feel valued. So bring them in from any college, Babcock, wherever, they've got a degree, but you now need to add that value. And that adding value will help them stay with you because they'll be loyal because they can see, I need to stay a couple of years to get the full picture of what this person is trying to put into me. Um, secondly, they will also see that, of course, money is important, but sometimes when you're seeing that what I am doing is important, that also will also keep the talent here and the market as well. Access to the senior um, talent to groom, we need the senior people to help the up and coming developers. And we've now, this conversation brought out that, hey, why doesn't he sometimes say, I'm gonna lecture in a college once a quarter? All of those people going around, you know, they have these master classes where they go into the colleges and they can have that opportunity to share their knowledge and inspire people to stay in this tech space and learn this. It's not a, a linear degree of just knowing about the tech. How do you solve the problem? How are you expanding it behind, as Amal mentioned, you're trying to, you would want to grow a business. You're not going to want to work for Joe Blogs forever. So how are you learning those entrepreneurial skills that you need to leave a company and then you know a problem that you want to solve. How will you scale that company? How will you build that company? Another area is understanding the data. We cannot just say that um, we're using whatever exists and then replicate it. You have to understand what are the market forces? What are, what are people already doing? What are in the informal sector? How can we take that? And if you want to say that the informal, informal sector are powering this economy right now. So the formal team need to leave their offices in Equity and VI, as, as uh, Annie Eddy said, and take it local local that can now become global because they're comfortable in where they are, they understood and building those soft skills. That's something that came in the questions, came in the panel, that sometimes we're ability to speak English is the issue that we might not, we will overlook someone that is actually a genius because they're just not packaged properly. You know, packaging is half of the battle. I, I always say in a many, and you know, I'm in the media space and, and branding, it's a case of packaging. It's not that the person there isn't the, you just need to package them up a bit, shine them up, put a bow. It sounds much more palatable when it isn't, uh, when it sounds, ooh, they speak in English. Wow, let's accept what they're saying. So let us also support the, mem um, the, the developers to also, um, hone in these soft skills, communicating, problem solving, packaging, as I would like to say, and that, and that would be another area. And we mustn't forget that um, upscaling across the ecosystem is going to be important. You, the skill sets are changing. Job, I said when I started this space, there was nothing called fintech. There was nothing called digital financial services. I was going around talking about mobile money and this, that, and people were throwing me out of their offices. So the market is changing constantly. So the skills that we need are going to change. The, the job descriptions are going to change. What you need to deliver is going to change. So that all that needs to be a constant um, uh, evolution of the ecosystem for the talent, because you can't say, I want to be a developer. What does that even mean? What developer, what do you know, which, you know, as, 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 as uh, any of these, I, do I need to know whether it's a uh, Python or this and that? Uh -uh. Build me the app that does this thing. Come on, I'm a consumer. I don't need to know what's in the back end. I will press it. I can find the weather. I'm good. Well done. What's behind it is none of my business as a consumer, so long as it works and it's consistent. So we need to make sure we're not focused on those I'm a developer, I'm, I've done this and I've done, but how is it actually delivering when you go out into the market? And in terms of this whole thing of from the cradle up, STEM in school, how can we get children talking about STEM, talking about 
entrepreneurship, all of that is so important in terms of developing this ecosystem, which is why the startup bill is great, that it's going very grassroots schools, tech hubs all over the place, just talking to everybody, the man on the street, what do you understand by this thing and how is this going to impact you to develop the startup space? And finally, we say that you know, some people are fast to the to the to the uh, uh, um, to the game than others. Government will be involved in this, how it, and they can scale this because the money is there. But it has to be there has to be a handshake in terms of what how we're working with them. Do they need to do it? Maybe they just say, okay, we've got this budget. We're just going to give it to Amal to go and execute, and then we now all look fantastic because the problem has been solved by someone who has already taken the time, failed several times has now perfected the process, then we can leapfrog because we're kind of get um, very early in the conversation. We said, we need to accelerate, we need to expand, we need to scale. And sometimes it's not about reinventing the wheel. Someone has done it, just help them scale and, and we'll achieve a lot more faster. So thank you all very much. We've run so out of time, but I'm very thankful to my panel this afternoon, Amal Hassan, Eniadu, Udabong, Chukuka Chukuma, Amakamokolo, and E Aboyaji, and I am Yoan Diadeusi. See you next week for another session of the Nigeria Startup Bill Learner Series. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amaka. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Thank bye. you. Thank you. All right, I think we're offline, I hope.